Today my talk will be uh, my talk will be on um, the scaling lessons that Zopim has learned over the past four or five years using Node.js in a production environment, and um, the second part of my talk will be on IP cluster, which is a small library that we have open we have just open sourced yesterday to help us with scaling Node server services. So. Um, I'm Yang Pin. My friends uh, just call me YB. I'm a co-founder of Zoping. Zoping is the best live chat company in the world. <laughs> it's used on 150,000 um, websites. We get 3 billion impressions on our chat widget a month. And at peak, we, we see 500,000 concurrent connections. So um, in uh, 2010, in the, during the end of 2010, we decided that we wanted to rewrite our dashboard after three years from Flex to HTML5. So um, at that point, Flex had, had been really good to us because they solve all the cross-browser issues and they have uh, TCP socket support so we could have direct connections to our server for, the, for, for um, all, the, all the streaming data. But we were getting running into more problems because we couldn't, it was difficult to hire people that knew Flex and also it was extremely difficult to customize, so our designers were not happy. So um, we decided to do everything in, in HTML5 again and um, apply some of the lessons that we learned building our dashboard. So for instance, in a, in a new version of our dashboard, we decided that the entire application state would be um, based on bindable data. So um, in the Flex version, we had usually have to make an API call and then set up subscriptions to pull data in. And that was very tedious and it, it meant that some parts of the application that when you, if you're not bothered to set this up, you had odd problems like when agents are added and so on, they do not reflect your UI. So we decided that we should write a set of um, Node.js servers that will help to translate the data from our backend into a format that's more digestible by our front end. So Node was a good fit for us at the time. It was a, a very familiar environment. And um, you can think of our, our mediator servers, as we call them, as a kind of dynamic uh, CDN, which, uh, which means we kind of cache all the dynamic information in our servers around the world. So distributing our servers around the world also give us additional benefits like lower latencies to our end users and um, being able to um, handle the load for different parts of the world. So Node.js really rocked. It was really fast. Um, so it looks good, but the problem is of course number three, which is a question mark, which is the typical node problems, which is the fact that it's single-threaded and we have memory leaks in our applications that are hard to track down. So all problems in computer science can be solved by a layer of redirection, right? So the easy way out is just to buy a couple of load balancers, proxies, SSL terminators, etc. But because we were a startup, we didn't have that kind of money, so we had to be a bit more creative with how we try to scale our, our servers. So these are some of the things that we tried. Um, obviously, the, the built-in cluster module, um, which works well for HTTP requests, but because we had our service was uh, live chat, we had persistent connections with our users so that we can stream the data. And this really breaks long polling connections because each additional each each time the long poll finishes, the browser will connect to a different server, and then you lose your whole application state. So that was out. Um, at the time, there was a web socket for Nginx, but it was a third-party module and it was not very reliable. Um, we looked at HA proxy and um, start. So um, HA proxy is uh, is a kind of dumb proxy. So the biggest problem with HA proxy was that there was no way we could get our client IP address in our application because um, we were using SSL and HA proxy doesn't understand SSL, right? So 
we looked at start, which is an SSL terminator. So what that means is um, your browser makes an SSL connection to start, start unwraps that SSL encryption, and makes a normal TCP connection to your server. So you do not have to handle SSL um, and all the decoding, all the decryption is done by, by, uh, done by uh, start. So your application has more CPU to do its own thing and you don't have to handle it. It can handle um, load balancing for you as well. So we went to start for a while, but um, and in the next slide, I will talk about how we solved the problem of trying to get the client IP address from start. Um, we also took a look at forwarding socket um, file descriptors. In Linux, you can send the file descriptor between processes. So for TCP, this would work because you could just send the file descriptor in a process and and read and write off that file descriptor. But we were using SSL, so that kind of broke the whole thing because SSL has this really opaque state that you can't send over a socket. So um, let me show you how we managed to capture our client address. So we were very happy that we were using Node because we could do things like this, which is basically hack um, the Node HTTP server so that um, what we did was uh, start had this option to after it unwraps the encryption for the connection sends the IP address of the client with the in the first four bytes of the TCP stream. So what we're trying to do here is we are trying to intercept that initial connection even before the HTTP server gets it, uh, read off the IP address, and then pass it back to the nodes uh, to nodes uh, HTTP server to do its uh, header passing and all the, and all the, all the other stuff that, that it has to do. So as you can see, um, what we did, let me go into a detail, we um, get a list of the existing connections on a TCP server, and one of these connection handlers, one of these connection event handlers would be the HTTP header passes. So um, we intercept the connection, and on, on uh, receiving any data, we attempt to, oops, we attempt to read off the first few bytes that makes up the client IP address and sets it on the socket connection and then pass through the remaining data to the original handler for this socket. So this works. It, it, it's a bit complicated actually because I've kind of taken out all the error handling. Right. Um, and But it worked for for us for, for quite a while and so we stuck with this for maybe half a year. Um, some of the other um, problems um, in general when you, when you talk about this kind of multi-layered uh, infrastructure where you have proxies, SSL terminators, is that you get buffer bloat which is when all the different components in your stack buffer a little bit of data and so from your application, you can't tell how much data is being buffered by the rest of the system, how much of it is still floating on the network, and whether your client has received the data or not. So um, after about six months, or rather for six months, while we were using Start, we occasionally got problems where Start just dies, and we also got these inexplicable errors that, um, that um, were thrown in Node because of something that Start was doing and um, the SSL, um, the TCP handler in Node could not handle this. So we continued to look for a better solution to solve our scaling problem. So um, let me step back a bit and give, give you guys a, a primer on neck masks. So um, you, I guess you are slightly familiar with um, IP addresses and a netmask that looks like this. So, <clears throat> is the IP address, and slash twenty six refers to the network that this IP address belongs to. So, what this essentially means is that the first, if you take the first uh, twenty six bits of this IP address, that is the network of this IP address. So, this is a way for network engineers to partition networks into, into sizable chunks, manageable chunks, and um, to, uh, for uh, administrative purposes, like you could 
route data, you could route packets based on which network they are coming from or which network they are going to. So we figured out that we could actually abuse uh, net masks by matching on the least significant bits. So when we match on the most significant bits, um, as in, uh, in, in a typical uh, way that people use net masks, if we did load balancing based on that, what the problem we would find is that you have some networks where you have a lot of users and some networks where you have very, very little users. So if you try and do load balancing on that, it just will not work because you just end up with um, these servers that have to serve a lot of traffic because, um, I don't know, everybody, like the whole of China is in uh, one small net block. So we figured that actually we could match on the least significant bits and in this way we get some sort of randomness when we're trying to um, route our users and at the same time because it's based on IP address so for long pulling subsequent connections will still go back to the same server. So in fact um, the Linux NetFuter module does allow you to match arbitrary netmask address addresses. So um, if you see there's a block of 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.3 that is the netmask that we're using. So what we're saying is um, match the last two bits of the IP address and that is the net block, uh, I mean so-called the, the, the slot that the client belongs to. So what we, what we do here is for each of these blocks, we route it, we redirect it to one of our worker processors and this has to be a, it has to be a power of two processors because of uh, yeah, how the net mask works. So we deployed this solution and it worked really well for us. We could scale the number of worker processors by adjusting the number of bits you, work, you match. So in this case, um, we're matching two bits, so there are four workers, but if we had like a 32 core machine, then you match five bits and have that number of worker processors. So this worked really well, although we still get we still have some remaining issues, which which is our application, our node application has some memory leaks and over time it builds up and as you know when node hits about one to two gigabytes of memory it starts to really slow down because it has to do garbage collection all the time. So what we did was once node hits around um, almost when you process one gigabyte of uh, memory usage we would we would restart that uh, that um, particular worker. It wasn't so bad in the sense that because it only disconnects the user that users that were connected to it which is uh, maybe one over eight of all the users connected to that particular server but it was, not a it was not a good experience for our users. So, um, and oh, okay, and, and we also had some um, human errors when we were attempting to deploy these rules because um, we generated them manually and when we wanted to add, change the number of slots, the number of workers per server, it, um, and we did not update the IP tables properly, it would um, break. So, we decided to write a new library to help us handle, it, handle all this IP tables uh, manipulation and at the same time help us manage um, worker processors, restarting them when they are using too much memory, restarting them when they are, when they are running out of, uh, when, when they are taking too long to respond and, and so on. So these are some of the features that our library has built in right now. So it's, it's multi-core, you use it like the cluster module in Node.js um, it has graceful worker retirement. So what this means is that when we want to queue off a worker, we don't we don't just queue it. But what we do is that we change the IP table rule, we spawn off another worker, we spawn off new worker first, and change the IP table rule so that it points to the new worker, and let the old worker continue to finish uh, servicing the request that that um, they are still outstanding. So that also allows us to do hot code reload. So when we have a new deploy, we can just make a whole bunch of new workers and point the IP tables to use the, use the new processors. So bare metal refers to the fact that our node processors, the, the, the socket object that you see is the actual socket that, uh, that is connected to the client. So things like drain events, they work reliably because you don't go through another uh, layer of proxy and obviously the client IP address is uh, directly on the socket. We make use of this uh, NPM module called 2BZ which pulls the node event loop and 
determines and tries to determine if it's taking too long to go through the event loop, which uh, which implies that the node processor is under is a uh, node process is under too much load and is spending all its time handling events. So um, that helps us that helps us to um, detect workers that have run into some kind of problem and they are just they are not servicing uh, requests fast enough. So, um, as I said, so the, so the master manages all the diff all the different workers, and we use um, uh, Unix domain sockets to communicate between the masters and the workers. The workers select the listening ports that they are listening on. So this um, what we do is that we get the operating system to do it. So you pick a random port, and the workers report the port that they're listening to to the master, and the master will set up the IP tables to make sure that it points to the right places. The master is also capable of um, of uh, managing other masters. So we have, in, just in case there's a bug in the master and you have to queue it or to run in another master, um, IP cluster is designed so that if you run another copy of the master, it will queue off the old one and manage and take over the existing workers and manage them properly. So we retire workers when um, so uh, in IP cluster we set a memory limit per worker and so. When workers approach the limit, we will grace. We will let them kind of shut down gracefully by um, by redirecting all the new requests to new uh, servers. There's also there's also a cluster memory limit for the entire cluster. So when um, you approach like the near the limit of the amount of memory the, the entire server has, we will find the oldest retired worker and kill that. So. We we have open sourced uh, IP clusters, so this is our this is our project page, and now I will run us through um, an example of IP cluster usage. Um, so this is a typical um, real time WebSocket based application. We um, start a web socket and on a connection we send the current date every 100 milliseconds so it looks like hang on. Um, Okay, there's a problem with a <laughs> demo, which happens every time. Um, okay, I think I have to skip the demo um, and run through. Uh, let me just run through how we how we want to use IP cluster, and as in um, how how can we use IP cluster and not affect our existing code base so much. So if you notice this on the right hand side, it's the same application. But below we add IP cluster support. So it's, a sim it's as simple as, um, it's actually familiar with, uh, if you're familiar with the cluster module in Node, it's actually pretty similar. You, re you require the IP cluster module um, set up the set up some settings for example so this is the socket that the master and the worker processors <coughs> communicate over you know set IP address because uh, otherwise we wouldn't know um, how to set up IP table rules so if you're a master you just set up master and uh, sorry and if you're a worker <coughs> you just start your your application as per normal except that this time you don't specify a listening port we let we let the operating system pick a port <coughs> and then we report 
to the port to the master and that's it the master will handle all the IP table rules so um, let me oops. <coughs> okay, so let me show you our IP tables. So I just listed all the rules in the NAT table for for this machine, and um, you notice there's nothing here. So I will now run. Um, the server with the IP classes support and we see that um, we have three rules now and then four so what happened was that as each worker was spawned it reported the port that was listening to to the, to the master and the master set up the IP tables for that for that particular uh, slot so um, it always waits until the worker Report support before creating the IP tables rule. So what this means is that it will never create an IP table rule before the worker is ready to accept connections. So let's see whether it works this time. Um, okay, I'm sorry. I think I have some error. Uh, it's supposed to show the time, but. I guess from the um, yeah, I guess from I guess from code is pretty straightforward how how it works. Um, yep. Yeah, so let me go back to um, the future. So um, to help us with our memory leak issues in the future, we are planning to add automate automated uh, heap diffing support. So the the good thing about uh, IP cluster is that because we can, we know when the worker starts, we can take a snapshot of the heap and when the worker is retired, we can wait until every single last connection has, uh, has been disconnected before we take another heap and diff the difference. So in this way, we can find memory leaks. There's also, um, it's a bit hard to see the health of the cluster at this point in time, so uh, some kind of Dashboard would be nice to be able to see what the cluster is currently doing. So, um, yes, um, this is a shout out to my team and Tim, who is one of our developers and has worked a lot on IP cluster. So, yep, that's all. So, I will take some questions. Now. Thank you. Could we have, uh, let's say, uh, one question maybe for Yang Bin? Yes. Uh, hello. Um, I'm just wondering if you have uh, have you ever tried to use, uh, let's say, you Redis uh, as a session store so that you can sync, uh, synchronize a session between multiple clients so that I mean you don't really need a, a sticky session. Uh, uh, for the, I mean, for all of the node, yep. and also have you tried to use uh, something uh, the new protocol, which is a proxy protocol, which is allow you to uh, load balance uh, between uh, multiple client, even if you use TCP. Um, so let me let me say I got your questions right. Um, your first question is um, why not why not use uh. Redis as a session store. Uh, yeah. Um, and I mean, uh, why you need uh, so that you can match yeah. the. Incoming connection with the with the existing connection. 
Yeah, right? so this means you don't even need the sticky section as the first place. So, um, so the thing is, we actually already kind of have a session uh, management system, which is our backend services. So, um, essentially, for the, our mediators, we could reconnect to another mediator and we can still uh, re reconnect back to the same session. But the problem is that there is a lot of uh, state in our front end servers because we are we are um, normalizing the data structure into a into a global streaming standard for our front end servers. So there's a lot of state involved, and while we can we can reconnect to a different server, it takes a couple of seconds to get all that state all set up again. So um, we that's I mean that's why we have we try not to have to move the state as much as possible. 